I have these on a storyboard if you want to look. And here, here of course, is what was the junior college then. It was really the grades 13 and 14 from the high school, uh, but they were all in this Hackley building. We were still using that building when I began teaching in 66, but I caught it the Vanderlaan building, not at the Hackley building. It's a strange building. You go up to the top floor, and they play basketball there on the stage. I can't imagine playing basketball on a stage, but it was different then. No dunking, you know. Uh, everybody was under about six feet tall. Uh, not a lot of uh, uh, movement. Uh, you had to, you couldn't go beyond the mid court line and so forth. All right, moving on. Industries. Now, of course, no matter where you were, you had cartoons hung up everywhere, uh, like this one, and we have a. A uh, guy in the Army Air Force, I guess. I've got a buddy waiting for that. In other words, they're making some kind of machinery, and uh, somebody's over there in the Pacific or in Germany or somewhere is waiting to get that. Can't do their job unless they get that equipment. And that's where Muskegon came in. And Detroit, Willow Run, and Los Angeles. And they're actually, I, I've come up with 11 different industrial establishments that were uh, singled out by the federal government for um, a special census in 1944. Now, as you may know, federal censuses are based on what are called manuscript censuses. In other words, somebody has the exact name of everybody they interviewed, what was their job, where did they live, all that stuff. Now, the 1940 census has been released to historians, and that was two years ago. You gotta wait a certain amount of time because some of those people might still be living, you see, and some of them still are. But I've got to figure that the special censuses are also going to be available in 45 or 46. So it'll be a wonderful opportunity for some PhD candidate or master's degree candidate. Get the census, which is now available for 1940, get the one from 44, and take a look at how things changed on an individual basis. It'll tell you where they worked, where they came from, where they were born, all kinds of stuff. Just exciting to me, maybe not to everybody, but to me, that's, that's if I needed to get another PhD, that's what I'd do, I think. I don't need another one. Got too many as it is, just one, that's all I got. Now these are some of the uh, businesses, again, in town. We've already been over most of them uh, that you have seen. Uh, the same map we had earlier, so I won't dwell upon it. Here are some of the factors. Now, we've already heard about Continental, this is a picture from the 30s of the plant downtown, the downtown Continental plant. During the late 30s, this was the only Continental plant in the whole nation still operating. Their plant in Detroit had been closed down, and they didn't have the Getty Street plant yet, so this was all there was. And they were basically making do the best they could. They had a labor force there of less than 7,000, which seems like a lot. But during the war, it got up to about 20,000 in more than one plant, though. Here, of course, we see it again. It's way over on the far left, and it has been expanded here. This is by the, this time the late 30s, early 40s. Uh, Lakey is in the foreground. Uh, here again, I think that's the same picture we started with. And uh, now here's the Getty Street uh, Continental Airport. If you go by there, you can still see that building. Uh, I remember going by there every day I went to work. Uh, this is where they had their hangar, this is their hangar, and this is how they communicated between Detroit and Muskegon by ear, a lot quicker, built in 1925. Now, in 1939, they moved their testing center out there. In other words, they, they would take their engines and run them to see that they work properly, and were they loud. I have an oral history from some people who lived about a mile away, and they would test every day during the war, all day long, all night long. And, and of course, people just got accustomed to it. So when the war was over, this one fellow said he went outside and couldn't figure out what was wrong. And he finally figured out there ain't no noise no more. They'd quit testing, so they didn't have to any longer. They'd pick it up again later on. Now here's the Getty Street plant. This is built in 41, operated in 42, 
And of course, this is where they're making tank engines and uh, aircraft engines. In, in fact, in some cases, the aircraft engine was the same as the tank engine. I mean, they just used the one for the other. And what do we have? This is, the, this is what the, their first big contract, the Rolls-Royce engine. See, Britain could not produce enough engines. They were being bombed all the time. And so they gave the patents to the United States and Continental got one of those contracts to build Rolls-Royce engines for the military. And we see the engine and we see, I think that's a Mustang uh, P-51. I think that's the same plane, that plane they used in the Navy, but they call it the Corsair or something like that. You remember, what's the name? Well, that, there was a naval equivalent anyway. I can't hear well. Someone's trying to help me, but I can't hear them. Well, here we have a couple of other, another engine. This one was used in the P-38. It's a fighter, has two engines. Um, I used to know how they work, but they, they, they move in opposite directions. Otherwise, your plane's probably going to go off course. Uh, I can't remember which way was which, but it depends on which way you're looking at the, at the propeller also. Uh, here's another example. This is a uh, McDonnell aircraft engine. Uh, I guess they started this late in the war, and uh, that's the one at the top. And the one below, those are all training planes. Again, Continental made a lot of the engines for the training craft that, where they taught young pilots how to fly. Here we, I think this is a B-24, is that right? I got it right? right. I, I was guessing, I didn't have anything to go on. Take a look at, they always named these planes. And this one must have had a bad time with his girlfriend at home. It's called Strawberry Bitch. <laughs> don't know, I don't know, didn't care for that. Here's a tank, this is a, uh, um, for the, uh, Army and it has, you can see what it uh, contains. They started making um, uh, engines for British tanks, again because the British weren't able to make their own. Uh, their plants were being bombed. Uh, here, of course, this is not Muskegon, this is the Detroit Arsenal. So the engines would go from Muskegon to Detroit and then they'd be put, it, put into these uh, tanks. Now this is an assembly line and uh, they've got some tank treads probably from Campbell and Cannon and they've got the engines from Continental and of course they had other parts being made. So you can imagine the logistical nightmare this would have been. Each tank probably has 10 or 20 different suppliers and they all had to be on time and they had to work right. So it must not have been easy. Here's some other Continental engines in, in trucks in the Jeep. They, they made Jeep, uh, uh, Willie's Jeeps after the war too. That was a big contract after the war and of course Jeep became uh, American Motors, and then American Motors sold out to Chrysler, and now it's all owned by Fiat. But uh, there have been several changes over there. Here's a, tent, a truck down at the bottom, and a squad car or a scout car down at the very bottom left. Lots of things all, and here again is the famous Jeep. They don't look much different than modern day Jeeps. The, the style has not changed greatly, at least the small ones. Here's a gun with a gun, looks like the Rat Patrol. Remember that old movie from the TV show? Uh, oh, these were British soldiers. Another example of a scout car. Now this I think was taken a little bit after the war. This is the Getty Street plant. You can see the expressway in the background. So that's why I'm saying late 50s, maybe early 60s. But they're making many of these same um, engines after the war and after the Korean War too.